Welcome to Meaning from Data, Statistics Made Clear. This is the third lecture. In the previous lecture, we described how to organize, describe, and summarize a set of data if we knew all of the data. And the conclusion of that lecture could be summed up by saying that if we know all the data in a population, at, then we will understand its distribution by describing its shape, its center, and how spread out it is. It's spread, shape, center, and spread. So in this lecture, we're going to introduce basic concepts and principles of statistical inference. Namely, how can we use information about just some members of a population to infer that information about the whole population? Well, for example, the center of the population. Suppose we know uh, we get, we just measure the heights of a certain number of people, and we want to estimate what the height of, uh, the middle height of everybody is. And we see the kinds of results of this type of analysis frequently, particularly in, uh, before an upcoming election. A pollster will say, a poll shows that candidate A is preferred by 56% of the vote, voters with a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. But I can assure you, you that most people don't know what that means. And in fact, you won't know what it means at the end of this lecture, but you'll begin to understand that. But you will understand that after lecture 11. Okay, now I'm going to do something I, I hate to do, which is to tell you the conclusion of this lecture right now. And uh, the reason I hate to do it is because it spoils the drama. See, and I like, I like drama, but I, but I think it's important to say this. Namely, the conclusion of this lecture will be that randomness is a central idea of statistical inference, randomness. And that the, the goal of statistical inference is to answer two questions, how close and how confident. Meaning, how close are the shape, the center, and the spread of this sample of a small number of elements from the population, how close are they to the actual population's shape, center, and spread, so how close, and how confident are we that we are that close? So those are the two questions, how close and how confident. Well, in the last lecture, we discussed several examples, including heights of men and women, batting averages of baseball players, salaries of, of people, mule kicks, remember the mule kicks, and um, SAT scores. Those were some of the ones that we talked about. So the challenge of this lecture then is if we don't know all of the information about every single member of those populations, how can we infer the whole population? So let's begin with the heights of adult American men. Suppose that we, we know just some of their heights. And what we really want to know is an accurate description of the distribution of the heights of all adult men in the United States. We want to know uh, the shape, not the shape of the individual men, but, but the shape of the distribution of the heights of the men. We want to know what the, what the center value is, like the mean of the heights. And we want to know how spread out they are, how many people are quite a bit taller than that, that average center value, the mean or the median, and how many are, are, are lower. So um, we'd like to get a, uh, a picture of the whole population by choosing a few good men. You see, we would like to choose a few men whose heights somehow mirror the heights of all the men in the population. So, for example, for the center, really, uh, that is to say, you know, the mean value of heights, all we would really need to do is choose one man. Namely, choose the one man whose height is average. And then, and then that would be great. Wouldn't that be a wonderful strategy? Because then we'd, we'd get the center value with just one person. There's only one slight defect to that wonderful strategy for figuring out the whole population's uh, distribution and center. And the problem is, of course, that we don't know the answer before we start. We don't know the whole population's center. Otherwise, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be doing it. That's the whole goal of our exercise of trying to infer what that center height is. 
If we knew the answer in advance, we could just select the people that reflect the properties of the whole population. So we could pick them to have the same average height. We could pick just one person or a collection of them that have the right average height. And we could pick a few people that, whose heights were distributed in the same kind of a way that the whole population's heights are distributed. You know, the same number that are close to each other, close to the center, and the same fraction who are, are, are much taller and so on. So our first thought of choosing a few good men, a few that actually describe the whole population, was uh, sort of a flop. It was a, it was a sort of a flop. But we should never give up. We don't give up just because we make a mistake. Because we, there is a bright side to this. The bright side is that we, we know that if we had a representative sample, if we had a few good men, a few people whose heights, centers, and spread really did represent the whole population, then, then that would be great. So the question is, how can we find those few good men without knowing what the population looks like in advance? This sounds like Mission Impossible, right? Mission Impossible. How can we possibly find something that when we know we don't know it? Well, we have to take a very crucial step, and that is to resort to thought. How are we going to get this representative sample when we don't know what it's supposed to be representative of? Well, by the way, it's true that in things like heights, since you're talk you see people all the time, maybe you have some sort of a guess about what the heights are. But in other kinds of things, like the thickness of the ozone layer, as an example, or something obscure, you have no idea, you see. So that you, can't, you can't judge the fact from what you know. But so since we don't have any, any knowledge at all, let's use that fact that we don't know that we don't know. I mean, life gives us lemons, let's make lemonade. Let's choose our sample using our total ignorance. In other words, randomly. We'll go out of our way to not pretend that we know anything. We choose people randomly. That actually is the key idea to statistical inference, to choose people randomly. And let's just try it. Suppose we choose one adult male to, to measure, one adult male. Now, you might say, well, you don't know. It, the person may be extremely short. That one person may be very tall. But as a matter of fact, um, if, if we are dealing with a case like heights of people, there, there is something that we do know about heights. That, namely, that people are different heights, but most people are somewhere near sort of the middle. So one thing that we could do is knowing sort of knowledge of, of humanity, having some knowledge about the distribution of heights in the population just by looking. And by the way, this is the kind of general knowledge where we don't know where it's centered, we don't know what the average is exactly, but we know that most people are about the same. This kind of knowledge can come from previous experience with other collections. For example, you might think about rat experiments to, because that's the kind of thing that we'll actually be using in future discussions about things like tests of medication. From different kinds of contexts, we might know, in the case of heights of men, that the, the heights of men are basically distributed in some sort of a fashion where the, there are people who have this sort of average height, and then there are some that are, are, are uh, sort of tapers off to the sides, that we might sort of have a predisposition to suppose that that is the general picture of the heights. But what we don't know, you notice that there's nothing on this axis, there's no number given. It doesn't say where the center value is because we don't know that. It also doesn't say how spread out they are. It doesn't, we don't know that either. But we, we can guess that the distribution of heights is something like this. Well, knowing that the distributions of heights can be uh, uh, drawn in something like this figure, when we choose a random person, notice that we're much more apt to choose a random person in the center area than we are to choose this random person out here. 
because most people in the population are closer to the center value than they are to an extreme value. You follow me? So even choosing one random person and measuring that person's height, we're more apt to be close to the middle than we are to be an extreme. Of course, it could happen. It could happen that we randomly choose, a, you know, some NBA basketball player who's seven feet tall, and that's our random person, and then we're, you know, misled. It could happen, but chances are better that we'll choose a random person in the, in the middle. Okay, now, how can we improve our chances of getting yet closer to the actual mean height of the whole population? How can we improve our chances? Well, how about choosing two men instead of just one? You see, if we choose two men and then we take their average, their mean height, we would tend to get closer to the overall mean because a lot of times we would choose one randomly who was a little bit too short and we chose another one who may be too tall. Or even if we chose two people who are both too tall, notice that the mean of those two would give us a number that wasn't as extreme being off as the taller one was. You see, it's sort of bringing things in, taking the average of two tends to get closer to the true mean. So, um, in any case, uh, we can, we're, we're, we, as we choose more people and take their mean value, mean heights, we're getting closer to the mean. Let, suppose we choose three men, or four men, or five men, or a hundred men. It's increasingly unlikely that their combined values are going to stay an extreme value out from the, from the uh, mean. In other words, they would tend to cancel each other out by randomness because it would be very unlikely. Just think about it. If you choose 100 people, it would be very unlikely that you chose all 100 to be above average, right? A property of average is half the people are below average. So, so they would tend to naturally um, uh, cancel each other out and have the population mean sort of come about without even trying, you see? So random collections of men will on average have close to the average height. And their uh, average height will, will tend to be more average as we get more people in the sample. It gets increasingly likely. Now, let's actually do some uh, numerical experiments here and do some examples. Okay, so here, here are, is a table that lists what, uh, what we did. Here's, here's what we did. We took a list of actual heights, and there were some thousands of uh, actual heights. So we'll think of that as the total population. And then from that, we took 100 men at, at random of that, from that list, and just took the average, took the mean of those 100, and got a number. So the first time we did that, this number right here, 68.58, was the first time we took 100 people and took their mean, and we got 68.58. We did it again, 68.32, again, 68.66, again, 68.18, and so on. The actual mean of the whole collection was 68.68 inches. And notice how close these values are. Notice how close they are. I mean, this one is the most extreme at the top, 69.3. And let's see, is this the smallest one? 68.18, which is half an inch too short. So by taking 100 people, the, the mean of those 100 just automatically got very close to the mean of the whole population. So, um, so what's interesting about this is that random chance leads to the actual correct value. You see that? Luck is on our side. This is great. Now, uh, by the way, I, I did the same kind of experiments. Now, and, and of course, I have to say, as you look at these tables, you say, well, maybe I cheated, you think. And maybe, maybe I cheated because maybe I tried it and I really got a whole bunch of things and I just put down the ones that were close to the average. Could have happened, we, don't, we do not know, but it, uh, you'll just have to take my word for it. Okay, now, so here are some other examples uh, from the populations that we looked at before. Salaries. So we had a collection where the population mean was actually 
uh, 0.5, and the mean of the sample was 68,557. So, I, so you see what I did? So I took 100 people and took their average just at random, and their average, look how close it is. I, in fact, just taking 25, the sample was pretty close, 68,315. SATs, the actual population mean from this big collection was 169.85, taking a sample of size 100, 1,086. In fact, even a sample of size 25, 1,076. In fact, in this case, the sample of size 25 is closer than the sample of size 100. Those things can happen just by random chance alone, you see. Where there's no guarantee in this business. There's no guarantee that we're going to get the exact value because just by randomness you could get more or less. Um, the male heights, you see how close we got when we took a hundred. Female heights, look at that. We got very, very close from the actual value was 63 and a third. The value from the just taking a sample of a hundred was 63.45. Batting averages, you see, are very close. The point of this is that randomness leads us to get close to the, to, the, um, to the actual population values by random chance alone. And that's, that's rather interesting. Um, this comes up in political polling. When we take a political poll and you ask people, who are you for, candidate A or candidate B? Suppose that we had a political poll being taken where the reality was that 60% of the population are for candidate A. We did some random uh, uh, computer simulations of this and to ask 100 people, just chose 100 people at random when we assumed that 60% were for candidate A, and the fraction of those 100, in other words, the number from 100, how many of those 100 were for candidate A in our, in our random sample were 55, 67, 59. So each of these represents taking a sample of 100. You follow me? Take 100 at random and you see how many of those 100 are for candidate A. Went from a population where 60% are for candidate A. And so the question is, how close are these values to the actual population 60%? And you can see that doing it in this case, we did it 10 times, that is taking 100 people 10 times. And notice that the, the furthest away that we got was 50. 50 was 10 away from the actual, actual uh, being completely representative of the true population. And on the, on the top side, it was 67. Where the, so among those 10 examples, our sample of 100 was pretty good. In other words, it was within 10 percentage points of the actual value. And in fact, we will, we will show by using probability, we will see what fraction of the samples of 100 tend to be close to the actual population mean, uh, the proportion in the population, and how, how many tend to be far off. In the case of taking a sample of size 100, 95% of the samples of size 100, if the true voting population is 60% for Canada Day, 95% of the time that you take a sample of 100, the proportion will lie between 50 and 70. And that's what we can prove using uh, an investigation into probability. That's the kind of of issue that we're getting to. So you can see that, that this is an example of where we're trying to answer the question um, how close and how confident. So the answer in the case of this population poll is that if we take a hundred people from a population of, you know, a very large population, like a hundred million, if you take a hundred people at random, if the truth is that 60% are for candidate A, 95% of the time that you choose those 100 people, you're going to get an answer between 50 and 70%. So that's how confident we are that we're that close. That, how close? 10%. How confident? 95%. Okay. This is a tricky notion, by the way. And I, I, don't, I want to make sure that you understand that we'll be discussing this in detail in lectures 10 and 11. 
that that it, it really is a rather subtle thing but that we're doing both how close and how confident and figuring out you know why did I pick 10 rather than five and what you know all of that is an, an is a result of a, a study of of uh, of uh, probability of samples but one thing I do want to say just as sort of a surprising thing to, to realize is that if you take a sample of 1200 random people from a population, even a population of 100 million, if you take 1,200 random people, you get a very good estimate of the proportion of people who are, say, for a given candidate. In other, it, specifically, you can be 95% sure that you're within three percentage points either way. So that's, that's rather interesting. For now, the important principle is that, one, randomness is involved in statistical inference, and that the conclusion of a statistical inference is uh, the conclusion is not a certainty about the whole population, but it's actually a pair of numbers. And the pair of numbers tell us how close and how confident, how close to the true population value the value of our sample is likely to be, and how confident we are that we are that close. And by the way, the same kind of reasoning applies when we're talking instead about proportions of the population or the center value like the mean of the heights, the same kind of, of, of thing pertains when we're trying to talk about, say, how spread out the population is. That we get an estimate from the sample and we use that estimate to tell us how, how, uh, how good the, the sample is, how representative of the whole population the sample is. Well, let's think of another kind of, of challenge of statistical inference. Suppose somebody hands me a coin, like this coin here, and says, this coin is balanced and it's a, a fair coin. It's as equal, if you, if you flip it, you're as equally uh, likely to get a heads as a tails. How would you test such an assertion? How would you test it? Well, what, what you would do is you would conduct some experiments. You'd flip the coin, you'd see whether it's heads or tails. Then, what would you do? You flip it again, see whether it's heads or tails. And you would continue to, to try the coin out and see whether or not you got a proportion of heads and tails that seemed to be about even. This strategy is a, uh, a, is a, a strategy that I want to describe, and I'll tell you right now that I'm very proud of this. So I want you to be impressed. <clears throat> the way that you can tell whether a coin is unfair is like the American system of criminal justice. The, the way we do it for the, for the coin is we're going to say, assume that the coin is fair, we do some experiments, and we see whether or not the experiment, uh, experimental outcome is, would be a rare event given that it's a fair coin. Now, you may not have understood this, but think of the American justice system. When the judge admonishes the jury, about a defendant. What does the judge say? The judge says, that defendant is innocent. That's your presumption. You presume the defendant is innocent. And then evidence is presented. And the evidence is saying, well, that person may actually, you know, uh, it looked like a witness says, it looked like the person who was in the neighborhood of the crime. This person was driving a car that looked like the car that was seen to be fleeing, and so on. Evidence is adduced about the, uh, about the, the individual who's on trial. If the jurors feel that the evidence is very unlikely, given the innocence of the person, then the jury finds that person guilty. You follow me? You assume innocent, you get evidence, and if the evidence is very rare given the presumption of innocence, then you have to change your mind and say that that uh, person is guilty. So in the case of the coin flipping, if you had a coin that was not fair, suppose that in fact this coin was not fair, it wasn't a balanced coin, it wasn't a fair coin, that when you flipped it, 70% of the time it came up heads, then what you would do is you'd presume it innocent, that is, you'd presume that it had an even chance of coming out heads or tails. And then you'd flip the coin a lot of times. And if you discovered that the, it, it came out maybe 65% of the time heads, then you would say to yourself, well, 
that is a very unusual thing to have happened if it were in fact a fair coin. And so the presumption of innocence of this coin is the evidence against it is overwhelming and you would change your mind and say, oh no, it's not a fair coin. So that is the strategy of statistical inference. And let me just show you a slide to, to illustrate it of how many times you might flip a coin to, to uh, see how close the, the values if, of 100 flips t tend to be for a fair coin. And so this is just an example of 10 flips of a coin. And you can see that these, these, um, these flips are, uh, do, do in fact tend to cluster around 50. They do go down, in this case, from 43 up to, what's the highest number, 64. So 64 is actually pretty, pretty far out. I'm, I'm surprised that there would be such a one. But that could happen, by the way, even rare times you might flip a completely fair coin and have it happen that 64 out of 100 times it, it came up heads. Because each time you flip it, it has an even chance. And occasionally things will happen where it's not, not an, uh, it doesn't come out even. Let me, let me just give you uh, um, an example where this same strategy of statistical inference comes in commonly, and that has to do with the testing of medications. If you want to test whether or not a medicine is efficacious, does it actually cure uh, a, a, the disease that it's intended to cure? What do you do? Well, you take a bunch of people who have the disease, you give half of them the medication, and you give half of them a placebo, and then you see who gets better? And if, of course, first of all, they all get better because we, we know that placebos work. You know, placebo, often people, you just give them a placebo and they feel much better soon afterwards. That's why in medical tests, it's not good enough to just give the medication, you see, because, and, and not give anything else because, because you're, you're not, it could be that if you give somebody absolutely nothing that has any actual medical value, it still has a positive effect. So instead, what we need to do is you give medicine to some people, placebo to others, and you see whether there's a difference in the number of people who get cured taking the medicine compared to those who take the placebo. So in this case, it's a, one more wrinkle of, of subtlety to tell the difference. You have to compare two different changing values and see if there's a significant difference. How do you tell if it's significant? You have to consult probability and say, if 40% of the people are getting better just with the placebo, what's the chance that 60% of the people got better taking the medication? Is that within just random luck that that could happen, or does it illustrate that the medicine is, is actually good? Well, I want to do one more example uh, before the end of this lecture because I think it's fun. And that is this. Um, those of you who have children or dogs, and, or both, probably have in your household a drawer that contains decks of cards. Now, uh, I call it a deck of cards, but if you have a, a collection of cards like this one that has a rubber band around it, do you have any of those like this with a rubber band? That means that these cards were collected probably from the floor when a bunch of kids were playing with them and you picked them up and you thought it was the whole deck, but who knows whether the dog went off with some of them and a few cards from other decks came in there, you don't know. So, so what we have here is a deck of cards, uh, well, a deck of something. So <clears throat> how can you tell whether this is actually a, a real deck of cards? Well, the natural way, of course, is that you turn them over, you look at them, you sort them, and you see whether any are missing or whether you have too many of something. But here's a method that you probably haven't thought of. What you could do is you could randomly choose a card, seven of diamonds, and then put it back, shuffle the deck, and randomly choose another card, seven of hearts. Put it in, choose an, randomly choose another one, six of clubs, put it in. You could do that, you could do that, say, mm, 3,000 times. Now, suppose you did that 3,000 times. You never looked at the cards. You never looked at the back of the cards except, to, except one at a time. Notice something. Suppose you made a histogram of your answers. So I happen to have one here. 
Here's a histogram of the cards, and instead of listing all the cards, I just listed the spades. Sometimes you get spades, sometimes you get the other things. Now, if you did this and you found this histogram, you, you would notice that roughly a lot of the cards have about 50 occurrences of being chosen at random. Look at this three. The three of spades was never chosen at random. What that means is this is very good evidence that the three of spades is not in this deck because you're expecting it to occur 50 times by randomness alone and if it occurs never, that's good evidence that it's not there. Same thing with the queen of spades and that's natural because some card games the queen of spades is bad so probably the dog ate that one when somebody was playing and you handed it to the dog instead of having to confess you had the queen of spades. Now look at this, look, look at this 10. You see how it's about twice as tall? That's evidence that there are two tens of spades in that deck. And look at this one over here. You see this? This is four times as tall as what you would expect on average if there were only one ace of spades. This indicates that in fact there are, since there are over 200, and there should be about 50 if it were evenly distributed, it means that there are four aces of spades in the deck. And that's, that's probably right, because having an ace of spades is, is, is a good thing. So probably people have added other aces of spades. So this is an example of when you take large statistical samples, you get information. So the logic of statistical inference is always to compare data that we collect to our expectations about what the data would be like if the world were random with respect to whatever the property is, like choosing people at random. And so the analysis of randomness and probability is what allow us to quantify our confidence in our extrapolations from some of the data, what the whole population looks like. Randomness and probability are the cornerstones of all methods of, of statistical inference. So here we've introduced some of the really rather subtle logic by which statistical inference flows and we'll be looking forward to, to uh, amplifying these and making them quantified, quantifying them in the future lectures. Thank you.